Uh, thank you so much for coming on a Friday afternoon. I know it's the end of the week and it's difficult, uh, but thanks nevertheless. I'm sure some more people are trickling in, but we are going to start on time. So welcome to the Center for Palestine uh, Studies annual lecture. Uh, I am Dina Matar. I'm the chair of the Center for Palestine Studies for this year, and I've been the chair for the past six years, following on from the footsteps of Professor Gilbert Ashkar, who has done considerable work uh, to support the center and to support Palestine studies and Palestinians in many ways. So the annual lecture began under the le leadership of uh, Professor Gilbert Ashkar, whose support and consistent, prin uh, consistent principles on Palestine and all forms of oppression have never faltered. So special thanks for all your work, activism and support, and also I thank the other members of uh, the Center for Palestine Studies uh, Advisory Board, Dr. Nimr Sultani, um, and Professor Adam Hania, who's there, and ab in absence, uh, Professor Isaac Berwazi, and also all uh, members of Center for Palestine Studies and supporters. So CPS was uh, formed in 2012 as the first intellectual space, space in the UK for the academic study of Palestine uh, as one of the most pressing uh, global concerns, a concern that has now been made visible to the whole world by the ongoing Israeli genocide in Gaza and ethnic cleansing practices elsewhere. Previously, the format of this was a lecture with one uh, kind of uh, senior academic speaking, uh, but due to various considerations this year, we had to change the format, and we are going to have a panel of uh, speakers, including myself, to talk about uh, media and Gaza which I think is one of the most important uh, topics to, uh, to talk about, but obviously uh, one of the most important topics, and I'm sure that our discussion uh, will bring out some aspects of media coverage of the genocide and issues related to that. Uh, before I move on to introduce the speakers, which I'll do very briefly, I think we should mark uh, International Women's Day and we, by, by remembering and speaking about the continuous struggle by Palestinian women, mothers, sisters, daughters, and their immense contributions to the liberation movement for a free Palestine. We also uh, should remember and mourn all the women, poets, writers, artists, journalists, and aid workers who have been killed by Israel in Gaza over the past five months. We salute the women of Gaza for their struggle and resilience, and above all, for the, humani the humanity they have shown uh, during their daily fight for their families' lives amid the horrific deprivation of food, safe drinking water, and health care that is being imposed on the people of Gaza. As activists gather on every platform, hard fought and won by women's rights advocates following decades of struggle, we must raise our voices against military occupation and its violence. Our conversation joint lecture today, you know, it's uh, in the format of uh, 15 to 20 minutes intervention, is titled Gaza Media Worlds Beyond Enclosures. Each speaker will talk for a while on areas related to media and communication, research, and also concerns, while also reflecting on the need to understand why media is central to politics, society, and culture, if not for its visibility, rights, and the law. So, uh, in terms of order of speaking, we will start with uh, Dr. Khaled Ahroub from Northwestern University in Doha. He is Associate Professor in Residence at the Faculty of Liberal Arts at Northern, Northwestern University in, in Qatar. He is the author of Hamas, A Beginner's Guide, which was published in 2006 and then republished in uh, 2010. Uh, he uh, also published other books, including um, Hamas, Political Thought and Practice in 2000, and uh, edited Political Islam Context and vers uh, Context versus Ideology in 2011. And he has been working on religious broadcasting and the Middle East, a book that was published in 2012. Uh, in Arabic, he is a well-known author, uh, poet, uh, novelist, if I may say, writer, columnist of all sorts, you know, jack of all trades, um, and he has uh, published quite a lot um, in his native language. Dr. Helga uh, Tawil Suri, uh, our friend and colleague from New York University, is Associate Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication 
um, and um, a professor of Middle East and Islamic studies and director of graduate studies at New York University in New York. She works on issues to do with technology, media culture, territory and politics in the Middle East with a particular focus on Palestine, Israel. Her work seeks to challenge the notion of an open and borderless world by looking at how technologies and their infrastructures, such as cell phones and the internet, impose new forms of borders and controls and work in explicitly territorial and political ways. She is equally interested in thinking about how spaces and things that are overtly territorial and political, like borders, checkpoints, and identification cards, themselves function in cultural ways. Helga has published a wide range of peer-reviewed articles and invited chapters and books. She is co-editor of uh, the 2016 book uh, called Gaza as Metaphor, uh, which she and I collaborated on, and we are currently um, about in the process of finishing uh, the um, editing process of another <coughs> co-edited volume called Producing Palestine. Uh, apart from uh, working as a scholar and a writer and a researcher, she is also a filmmaker, right, and an artist. So a jack, oh, well, a jill of all trade. Let's not think about gender differences here. So it comes to me, I am, um, I, I, I am professor of political communication and Arab media, and I'm the chair of the Center for uh, Palestine Studies at SOAS. I work on the intersection of politics, communication, and culture, my first monogram is called What It Means to Be Palestinian, is a composite narrative or a people's history of Palestinians before the Nakba to the Oslo Agreement in 1993. Um, and I am currently trying to work on a sequel, uh, bringing this composite narrative to the present, the format of, of which keeps changing all the time. So again, I have uh, co-authored a, a book with uh, Lina Khatib on Hezbollah uh, politics and communication, and again, co-editor with Helga on uh, the books that I mentioned, and co-editor with uh, my uh, friend Zahira Harb uh, of uh, Narrating Conflict in the Middle East. Middle East. So, the format will be, again, as I said, 15 to 20 minutes, and we will be uh, strict with the timing. I think we will start with Khaled, and then me, and then Helga, and you will find out why they, we did it in this order. This is a recorded uh, lecture. At the end of our talks, we will have uh, questions and answers. And we have some uh, student ambassadors who go around with the microphones, so, and they will identify themselves uh, when the time comes. But for the uh, meantime, can you please join me in welcoming our speakers who have traveled a long way. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming uh, again, as uh, Dina said, uh, on Friday evening, which is very precious in the post-colonial world. Um, well, thank you, Dina, again, for the very generous introduction, and thank you specifically for not finishing, you know, the other part of the metaphor, Jacob of old, uh, maybe master of none. But uh, uh, again, I, I have to express my um, um, gratitude for inviting me. This place is uh, very dear to me, in fact. I used to give short courses on politics and, and Islam and, and the rest of it when I was in Cambridge uh, with the center of uh, Middle East. So I am very familiar to the landscape and, and the place and really uh, excited. Uh, now, my talk is divided into two parts. One part is um, a broader perspective into what's happening in Gaza that I think and I hope could provide some fresh perspective, could be helpful. And the other part, I will delve into the media uh, component of uh, the first part, which is the overarching one. Um, I, when, I, when I try to put a title for myself and then for this talk, uh, about the remarks that I'm going to be um, discussing, I put the following. Um, the Gaza genocide, an ultimate and ultimate manifestation of deep colonialism. Uh, 
and the whole notion and the whole maybe idea that I'm trying to uh, discuss with you tonight is deep colonialism. And I think um, the sheer genocidal practices that we are seeing on a daily basis nowadays in Gaza need all of us to uh, maybe uh, re-examine, revisit our traditional, conventional ways of understanding what has been happening in Palestine over the past eight decades. This is, this is uh, a genocide, this is an event that goes beyond contemplation, beyond uh, uh, description. As we speak now, maybe when we finish this, uh, this meeting, an hour and a half, we will have at least maybe between 10 to 20 people uh, died in Gaza. And this is happening live. So this is a living genocide. In every single case of genocide, I think, um, that we have discovered in, in the academia and the media and the research, we have to go back and dig into, into um, evidence. Uh, how many people uh, had died, uh, what kind of evidence we have, uh, the bodies, maybe the bones, the graveyards, and this and that. We don't need this. Nowadays in Gaza, this is happening on, on, on TV screens. Um, streamlining on our mobile phones and, and, and TV. So there, there is a uniqueness, which is a shocking uniqueness on the brutality of the event while the whole world is, is watching. It, it, and for five months, not only the scale of things, but also even the timeline is, uh, is shocking. So I thought maybe we need, we need some new perspectives. Uh, and I am trying here to connect part of my research, uh, and this is, uh, this is the, the, the subject of my coming book, uh, called Deep Colonialism in Palestine, trying to re-understand what has been happening, that the, the nature of colonialism in Palestine. And I thought, uh, and this is the thesis of the book, that we need, there, there has been multi-layered colonialism in Palestine. It started in the 19th century all the way through until this very moment. And this deep colonialism, in fact, is, is uh, constituted of three layers. It's three layers that have been um, functioning together from day one until now, uh, playing different roles, but none of them cease to exist. And these three, I, we have three forms of colonialism in Palestine, in my view, and according to what I'm trying to discuss in the book, uh, and I, now I am using this to understand uh, the, the Gaza genocide. The first form is imperial colonialism, and the second one, religious colonialism, and the third one, settler colonialism. We all know settler colonialism, and this is maybe the, the common, let's say, description and understanding of what's happening in Palestine, which is uh, very helpful, of course, but I think it has become maybe uh, insufficient to understand the, enti the entirety of the colonial uh, project in Palestine. And when I combine these three, imperial colonialism, which means, of course, the imperial interests behind the great powers that have been support, supportive of the Zionist project since day one. Uh, so you can, Great Britain, France, um, the US, and, and the rest of uh, the suspected ones. That started maybe early on, and it is still until this very moment. What we are seeing in Gaza is this very strong imperial interest in supporting the project. So it is still live and kicking, this imperial dimension of the colonial uh, project in Palestine. So we cannot just simply say this is a settler colonial project. In fact, it's still, it is still at the core imperial enterprise. So you have the imperial colonial element, I think, is still here. And it helps us in understanding this massive support to Israel that we have witnessed from day one after uh, October the 7th. October the 8th, um, American and, and European British uh, military ships were cruising to the Mediterranean, to the shores of Palestine from the second day. So this is, this is one thing. So I think, and of course you can go back through the Cold War era uh, at any point in time, you will see this element, the imperial component of the colonial project in Palestine, functioning and operating very strongly without any uh, slowness. 
The second one, and I am mentioning these ones not in, uh, in, in a timeline or successive manner. In fact, they started maybe at the same time and then they kept kind of moving on uh, in parallel. So there is no, again, consecutive kind of uh, manner or fashion in understanding, in linking these three forms of colonialism. Religious colonialism started even before the Zionist project in Palestine, as we all know. Uh, we have the movement of the restoration of the Jews to Palestine, and this is a purely Christian movement. And it started maybe a century before even the idea of Zionism. So you have this thinking within certain uh, Christian uh, groups and, and churches believing that, you know, bringing or gathering the Jews, the Jews of the whole world to Palestine is a condition to uh, the appearance of the Messiah. So this is a Christian endeavor, a Christian project. Herzl was, was not even born and the whole idea of Zionism. So when Zionism and Herzl came into being, the, the land was so fertile to the idea. You had a century, a century of dozens and dozens of projects intensified in the mid 19th century with the British Council uh, consul in, in Jerusalem and the American consul in, in, in Jerusalem believing, strong believers in this. And they thought their mission was not to serve Britain, not to serve America. It was, in fact, to serve this idea, the idea of having bring, bringing the Jews to Palestine so that we speed up the appearance of um, uh, the Messiah. Now, the same idea, this group is, is evolved became even bigger, more influential, and now until Mike Pence, who was the vice president of Trump, he was part of this, part of this movement. So you have the evangelicals nowadays, Christian Zionist uh, movements, they are the continuation of this. So from that one, early 19th century until now, you have this thrust, the religious thrust, supportive of Israel and the Zionist project all the way through. And then the third component, which is, that is, we all know, the settler colonial component, that, and it is started with the Jews now coming to Palestine, supported by these great powers and having this and that kind of help from different, and then settling in Palestine. Before and then they became even, the whole settler colonial project became even more intensified and successful after the creation of Israel until this very moment now spreading into the West Bank and, and elsewhere. So you have the settler colonial component, meaning I am having now these European Jews coming from Europe and settling in Palestine. But this settler colonial perspective for me does not explain the entire, in fact, and the magnitude of the project and the success of, of the project so far. And nowadays, what is happening, what protects the genocide in, in, in Gaza is these three components of, uh, of colonialism. Um, the imperial component, the religious component, and um, the settler, of course, component. And if, if you think, if you pick any one of these, I, I have to move because of the time. If you pick any one of these, you can find loads of evidence. Again, we all remember, you know, the statement that was said by the um, Blinken in Tel Aviv in the, the second day of, of uh, October the 7th, that I am here not as... as um, uh, Secretary of State or State of Secretary uh, in America, but as a Jew. And then you have so many statements. In fact, you know, maybe one can write a book about statements coming from the religious, uh, the, the, the Christian Zionist um, uh, constituency in America, saying we have to, we have to support and anybody that supports, you know, uh, Israel is, is blessed by God and, and, and the rest of the discourse. Well, I have, I think, wasted most of my time in this. Uh, so little has been left to the media uh, component. Uh, let me uh, skip this and then come to the uh, media thing, which I think because of, the, because of this genocide in Gaza, I think we as academics, researchers and activists, we have ended up with so many questions uh, at the conceptual theoretical level. Um, how can we approach these things? Now, in, in, in within this genocidal event, we can identify genocidal diplomacy. This back and forth nonsense, 
time wasting diplomacy. This is a genocidal diplomacy that is meant to, to allow the criminal to continue with their murder, in fact. You have genocidal, um, genocidal aid as well. The whole provision of aid is, is so genocidal. Again, just to provide and to extend you know, the time and, and the space for Israel to continue with whatever they are doing now on the ground. And then you have genocidal media. So the whole media thing is, again, and we, we, we don't need any evidence. Every one of us has their own anecdotes and the stories about the media, the role of the media, Western media, mainstream Western media, because you have some other medias that we, are, we have to respect and they have played a great role in, against this, this media. But I think we need to thank in the global politics, but all academia in, in how we understand uh, the, the, the world that within the genocidal media, and again, I speed up my, my remarks to finish, I hope, in time, I think we can, again, identify some, some uh, main features, main characteristics. One of them is, I call it, strategic lying. So lying is part of any, any warfare, we know this. But the strategic lying is, is far more deeper, deeper in depth and, and, and bigger in scale. That I lie in your face. I am telling you, you know, the hospital was, was an Ahli hospital or a Shifa hospital was fired uh, on by the Palestinians. And we all see this on the TV, that this is a big lie. So I keep lying. And this lie is part of the narrative. It, it flies and, and, and travels as part of the stories. So strategic lying has been part of the media genocide, I think, and we can talk even maybe more about this. The second thing is, I call it applying the titanic deception model. Uh, and I teach this, I invented this maybe for my students back in, 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 at Northwestern University, media students, so this is, I don't know, this is kind of attractive. This is about Titanic. So about Titanic, I ask them, who are the, the main celebrities, the main figures in, in, in the Titanic? Guys, anybody remember in the Titanic? Hmm? Jack and Rose. So Jack and Rose, Jack and Rose. So the whole, we spend the three bloody hours, you know, following, you know, what Jack and Rose are doing. And in the back of the story, back of the, you can see you know, hundreds of people, you know, nameless, faceless people dying, drowned in, in the ocean. Nobody cared about them. Nobody of us cared about them. We just were directed and emotionally even blackmailed to care about Jack and Rose. Now, the whole issue about the hostages, this is the modern Jack and Rose. Everybody talks about the hostages. So I don't care about you know thousands. Of, if, even if they come to thirty thousand Palestinians killed, if you have one hundred thousand Palestinians injured and wounded, these are the faceless, nameless guys on the ship. Part of the furniture, part of the scene. But you know the most important element of the story is Jack and Rose. So I think this dramatization of Jack and Rose against the rest of us is something deeply racist. Why do you give more value to the lives of Jack and Rose to, than the value of, of the rest of the ship? Maybe we can accept this in, in, in novels and, I don't know, filmmaking, because you have to personalize it and then you have to, to make a story. And the, Okay, this is fine, maybe in drama, but we should not accept this in, in, in real life. We should not accept the titanic racist approach to be applied to real life. The Sudanese nowadays who are killed in thousands in Sudan, and nobody care, cares about them. These are human beings as well. So I think we need in, in, in the media, in, within the media genocidal uh, apparatus that we have been witnessing about Gaza, we can identify this racist approach uh, totally. The final thing, and this is the good news, Dina, the final point, which is this witch hunting of the opponents. So anybody who says otherwise, this is the main narrative. This is the story. This is the sacralized story, which is October the 7th and the hostages, period. So if you go beyond this, then this is, you are anti-Semite, you are anti-Israel, you are the long list. And then by, by, 
by this witch hunting, what I am achieving is spreading this um, chilling effect, intimidation, so that I target Dina, then everybody else around Dina, they will be scared and then we'll, they will take a, a few steps back. And this is what I want, lowering the ceiling. So this kind of uh, attack to, against Jalbeer, against this uh, long list, it is not meant to intimidate Jalbeer. He doesn't care anyway, we know this. But you have circles around him and wider circles, they will think it twice if they dare to say the same thing that Jalbir has said. So this is what, what, what is meant, what is in fact has been targeted. They targeted me. Most of my colleagues at the university, they took one step back. They said, oh, I'm not going to risk myself. Otherwise, they, I will be put on this, the Canary mission list or, or professor's watch list, whatever. So all these lists, the lists of honor, by the way, but not everyone is, is, is ready to do that. And then the drowning effect, I call it. The drowning effect, they keep you busy in defending yourself. And um, this is within the, the witch hunting process. So instead of you engaged in, 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 in the issue about Gaza and talking about Gaza and defending and whatever you are doing, now you are engaged about defending yourself and saying, this is not what I said. This is, on the other day, they sent me, I think at Texas University or something, they removed one of my books that you mentioned on Hamas, Hamas, uh, Beginner's Guide. And um, it was a, on a display. They had uh, some, I don't know, book, uh, book fair or something. And then so a group of Zionist students, they said, this is anti-Semite. And it was translated into seven books, uh, seven languages, and highly, I don't know, received. It's not uh, apologetic of Hamas, very critical. Um, academic book anyway and then I sent I, I sent them a link said well you can find my book on the uh, Israel's national library so my two books on Hamas they are, you can find them there and then the American and then they sent me a long list of I have to answer what I said in the book so wasting my uh, maybe two three days of my time no I'm not going to answer these things Call me whatever you like. But the idea is to drown you with all these emails back and forth, back and forth, until um, um, there was, uh, I was hoping to reach, to tell you some another anecdote, but I think I finish here, and thank you very much. Thank you, Khaled, and I think my talk is not going to be very intellectual. Um, maybe trying to think about the concept of media worlds um, and trying to think about media worlds in relation to uh, Palestinians in Gaza. Um, the word media worlds that we wanted to use today come from the title of a book, an edited book, by, uh, edited by Leila Boulogne, Faye Ginsberg, and Brian Larkin, uh, way back, maybe about 20... 25 years ago. Um, and in their edited book, which is called Media Worlds, Anthropology of a New Terrain, they use the, the term to refer to ordinary people's engagement with and use of media and to question the role and power of the media in the world from the perspective of those who use it, consume it, and produ or produce media. So it doesn't come from the perspective of the power elite. So media worlds, in a way, as, as I understood it from that book, refers to quotidian social processes of production, consumption, and circulation. And they can be seen as spaces where ordinary people, including those who are marginal, talk back to power while engaging in self-representation and self-visibility. In the context of a brutal war and in conditions of total destruction of the people, their lives and histories, the question that came to my mind was, what do media worlds mean for Palestinians forcefully enclosed in ever-shrinking places, um, spaces of confinement and enclosures where they are, they are uh, silenced and rendered voiceless while simultaneously being subjected to Israeli genocidal and propagandist uh, practices and language that violently intervene in the political and the social, the representational and the discursive. 
I found uh, myself asking what are uh, the media worlds of people in Gaza when their very existence is at stake and then when their lives are reduced to bad lives. How can we reflect on media worlds, what they make possible or impossible, what they uh, tell us or what they don't tell us, what happens to the potential of speaking and acting when destruction, including the delib deliberate destruction of entire families, uh, is what Palestinians are experiencing in real life. And so I ask myself, what do these media worlds tell us about Palestinians' experiences without ourselves reducing the people that we are talking about, that is the Palestinians in Gaza, to mere subjects of our inquiries and of our studies? So I must point out at the outset that the talk here is suggestive and it's not conclusive. It's just, you know, kind of talking but it's a kind of trying to think about media worlds in, in a different ways. But I begin with a proposition that media worlds are real and imagined social and political fields of conflict and flux. They are fields of conflict over voice, representation, spaces, lives, propaganda, disinformation, and narratives. Uh, media worlds are complex and interlocking, and they are more so for Palestinians in Gaza, who have to condemn, I propose, uh, with three different and competing yet interlocking media worlds. The first of these, I suggest, is what we might call the media worlds of mainstream Western media that have been active in legitimizing Israel's violence against the Palestinians and promoting anti-Palestinian racism. We have many examples of that. I don't need to um, provide them. Even a cursory examination of the discourse of these media and the language that they use um, and, you know, people might ask, well, what is mainstream media? It's the, you know, the, 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 what we call legacy media. It shows that they repeat without questioning of uh, the uh, language that is used by Israeli officials and army personnel. And they also propagate without scrutiny vicious Israeli uh, PR campaigns aimed at dehumanizing Palestinians and legitimizing Israel's strategies and plans. In fact, a quick content analysis of media reporting shows the repetition of phrases, for example, Israel has the right to defend itself, um, as constructed legitimizing uh, discourse for any discussion without paying attention or discussing the consequences of exercising this right to ordinary Palestinians, nor to the context in which it emerges or the fact that Palestinians are made invisible and non-existent in, non in this language. What is overlooked is the fact that uh, Palestinians have been, and you mentioned, and, and you know, Khaled gave us a, a bit of historical background of, around uh, imperial colonialism, is that Palestinians have been um, subjected to a state of permanent war, which Cameroonian philosopher and political act activist Akili Membi sees as the defining principle of colonization and con continued colonizing practices. He says, and I quote, a fact remains, though, in modern philosophical thought and European political practice and imaginary, the colony represents the site where sovereignty consists fundamentally in the exercise of power outside the law and where peace is more likely to take on the fact of a war without end." Unquote. So in the media worlds of the mainstream Western media, and I must, gen must not generalize here, the war against Gaza is mostly mediated through an overwhelmingly one-sided Israeli perspective of the war and presented through the voices of uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the IDF, and the hostages and their families. This type of me mediation cons constructs Israel as a nation, aggressor and victim, uh, but the strong linkages between the three mean that personal, that personal traumas of victims experienced during and after the attack of uh, on October the 7th are difficult to narrate separately from the catastrophic war which was said to be waged as, as a response to an Israeli national trauma. In the process, Palestinians in Gaza have become less visible and their suffering uh, risks being subordinated to government agendas, which is a, pr a problem that has been exacerbated by the continued denial by, Israeli, by Israel of access to Gaza, uh, access to Western uh, journalists in Gaza, the shutdown of communication networks, the killing of Palestinian journalists, the censoring, uh, censoring of social media posts and accounts, all of which make it possible or extremely, uh, certainly extremely challenging to document, produce, and importantly, to respond. 
Our colleague at the LSE, Lily Shulyaraki, notes media representations of war not only communicate the unspeakable horror of the battlefield, but also ask us to imagine who we should be and how we should think and act in response to military violence. But understanding how representations of suffering in Gaza act on us as spectators, invoking our attention, yet deflecting our gaze from other, our gaze from other important realities, can be helpful in thinking about what might be missing. It might also help us consider where else we might look for answers that can guide our efforts to act in solidarity with all those affected by the war, both on near and near the battlefield and even I come to the second media South media over visibility of violence, death, and destruction. That is kind of permanently on the screen. The battlefield in this media world is most, mostly represented as Gaza, though we know, of course, that the battlefield extends well beyond Gaza and that violence has been and continues to be an extraordinarily important aspect of all Palestinian lives, as Edward Said noted a long while ago. In images, videos, commentaries, and narratives, these media worlds show us the personal, social, and political impact of the war, and particularly the scale of Palestinian suffering. The di but the difference between the world, the, this world and the first one is stark and troubling, as it always has been. It's not new that there is differences between the Western and the Arabic media, particularly in relation to Palestine. And yet, in this media world, Palestinian narratives are tightly framed, again, by the uh, dynamics of their excessive mediation. Mediation happens through imagery of the aftermath of uh, IDF bombing campaigns, um, decimated refugee camps, houses and schools, as well as overflowing hospitals filled with the injured and dying images of women, women wailing and desperate to find their shelter and, and uh, crying uh, for their off offspring and over the dead. Mediation also happens through the various voices that speak on Palestinians' behalf. The elite, that is the journalists, Middle East experts, the authoritative, maybe UNRWA, um, chief executive and other UN NGO leaders, witnesses, doctors and NGO, staff working in locations where Palestinians have been forced to move to, and of course, the heroic Palestinian journalists on the ground. These media narratives are overwhelmingly focused, not unexpectedly, on the scale of the catastrophe being experienced by Palestinians. But as researchers have shown in privileging the spectacle of suffering when the drama of violence and humanitarian disaster is the overwhelming focus, context and personal voices can easily be lost. Palestinians have certainly been invited to explain their grief and trauma, but when their narratives are limited to trauma and loss, the coverage also objectifies their status as an urgent, quote, humanitarian cause, unquote, in the immediate present, rather than caught up in long-term chronic violence perpetrated by a settler colonial state. Simultaneously, this coverage can limit discussions of the effects of the war on Palestine's rich political, social, and cultural fabric, the destruction of which is a, cult is a crucial aspect of the violence meted out against the Palestinians, through practices of ethnocide, domicide, educide, and memoricide, you know, killing whole families. So killing Palestinian memory. Finally, this mediation also obscures the ways in which different Arab countries have used the war for their own purposes and their political agendas. So the third media world is the media worlds of Palestinians in Gaza. These worlds are ever shrinking online and offline worlds. Um, mobile phones, other services that they use to kind of um, communicate with the outside world. These worlds are increase increasingly dangerous and surveilled. They are heavily mediated as well. These are shrinking worlds given the Israeli, persist uh, given the Israeli persistent practice of turning off communication at will and when it pleases, and also suspiciously before it, it launches a big attack um, in which many Palestinians are killed. These media worlds are controlled by the structural unequal features of social media platforms, algorithmic bias, misinformation, and propaganda. They are disruptive spaces too, and yet these media worlds mean, remain some of the very few spaces for ordinary Palestinians to communicate and talk to each other, and for creating media irrespective of disruptions, as we see in the increasing um, 
personal stories of atrocities and survival in Gaza. It is in these worlds that Gazans escape Israel's territorial and communication siege, um, and it is in these worlds that Palestinians perform Palestinianness, what it means to be Palestinians as an anti-colonial identity. And it is in these media worlds that pro-Palestinian solidarity is performed as well. As such, at the very basic level, these media worlds might provide some solace to Gazans and for us watching from afar, as they show the people that much of the world's population, even if not official representatives, recognizes and supports Palestinian demands for political rights, or perhaps more simply, demands for life void of constant violence. In these worlds, we see what Abu Lughod and the co-editors might have intended us to see and look at, that despite the incredible destru destruction, Palestinians are producing, talking, sharing, resharing, and following, and are being followed. Um, particularly, we have the, you know, the follow followers of the brilliant uh, Palestinian journalists who have become household names. Um, and then, so we have the, you know, from the voices of the journalists to the voices of the children of Gaza telling their stories, uh, to the mothers and women speaking of heroic attempts to find food and care for the wound wounded, um, uh, to the voice of Ziad, I don't know whether you've read Ziad, 35, a 35-year-old 35 Palestinian who tells us of everyday lives in the rubble of what was once Gaza in his regular column to the uh, Guardian newspapers. When I see his writings more and more erratic in their appearance, I am reminded of the words of thousands others seeking to tell their stories and reminding us of the words of martyred intellectual and poet Rifat al-Arir, who wrote before he was killed by an Israeli strike, if I must die, you must live and tell my story. And I'm reminded of Edward Said, who knew as much back in 1986, when he sought to wrestle with the, in, um, in, um, with the fact that it is the Palestinians' very existence and presence that matters in this equation. And as he wrote, and I quote, to the Israelis whose incomparable military and political power dominates us, we are at the periphery, uh, the image that will not go away. Every assertion of our non-existence, every attempt to spirit us away, every new effort to prove that we were never really there simply raises the question of why so much denial of and such energy, energy expended on what was not there. Could it be that even as alien outsiders, we dog, we dog the military might with our moral claim, our insistence that we would prefer not to, not to leave, not to abandon Palestine forever? Sorry, it's a bit uh, emotional. <laughs> Um, so I've made it a point to actually start every talk that I give since October with a kind of preamble, which is that Gaza is Palestine and is central to Palestine morally, politically, economically, ethically, I don't know, historically, and so on. So even though we speak of Gaza as Gaza, we should never forget that Gaza is also part of a much larger whole. Um, so I tried to sort of play around with the title of the... Um, panel, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, so I've just sort of moved things around, and so the, the title that I'm proposing for my own uh, sort of um, talk here is Enclosed Gaza Beyond Media. So there have been, I think, uh, two tropes that have been coming out of Gaza for the past uh, few months. The first is, when al Arab, when al muslimin right? Like, where are the brethren? Where is our kin? Where are the other Arabs? Where are the, Musl the, the other Muslim nations who, with the exception of Yemen, um, are kind of nowhere to be seen or heard or, or felt? Um, not necessarily, obviously, in the realm of the popular, but at least in the institutional or governmental support level. The second trope that I think also kind of comes uh, f from the past few months is, it comes from a sort of manifest belief in the power of what I'm going to call old media or legacy media or mainstream media. And it goes something like this, which is let them see, let them see the horrors that the world is committing, right? In the hope that us seeing these things is going to somehow change global opinion, which would then ultimately change into institutional governmental policy towards Palestine. 
These are not new tropes. These existed, for example, after 1982 in terms of Sabranchitila. We heard them in 2002 after the incursions of Janine. We've heard them in 2014 after the bombardment of Gaza then, and many, many other examples throughout uh, sort of history. I think it's time to move beyond these tropes. And I think it's time instead to listen to a third thing that has been coming out of Gaza over the past 150 plus days. And this has everything to do with our shared sense of exasperation, fear, disbelief, rage, sadness, anguish. I feel like the adjectives at some point, I don't even know how we feel anymore. But anyways, um, this trope, this third new kind of trope is manifested in the images of a despicable, almost pornographic violence of bodies blown apart and emaci emaciated, starving children. And it comes in phrases like this, how many more killed and maimed babies will it take? What number of killed will be enough? What more could you possibly need to see? Okay, and I don't know how much you've been watching things, but this is something that's actually being repeated uh, uh, over the past few months. And so if we listen, I think this trope is actually telling us something profound. What else is there to see? If we've been listening to Gaza, not just for, since October, but for the past few years, Gaza's actually already pushed us beyond the point of language and beyond the point of representation. Gaza, I think, has far exceeded the threshold of unlivability which is what the UN report back in 2012 had already predicted for Gaza. So Gaza today really marks, I think, a point of revolution. And when I say revolution here, I mean a turning over, a kind of fundamental shift in direction. So you know Einstein's quip of um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? It's time for us to do something a little different. Right? And so I'd like to propose that the answer to what else is there to see begins with beyond media. So in asking us this question, I think Gazans and Palestinians have actually recognized the limits of the representational and the limits of media. And this I kind of want to suggest sort of further builds on a kind of another argument that's been made over the last few months um, since October, which is that you know there is no going back to the status quo on the ground. All right. And that I, I'm going to sort of then suggest that there's also no going back to the status quo on a mediatic level. So the challenge ahead, I don't think, is more representation or better representation, because that would be akin to doing more and more of the same thing and expecting a different kind of result. The status quo being here, representation in the media, as we've largely approached it throughout the latter half of the 20th century and the early 21st century what I'm referring to as old media, or legacy media, or mainstream media. We can refer to it by name, the BBC, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Agence France Presse, the list kind of goes on. I can refer to it by technology or by medium, newspapers, broadcasting, TV, cable, and satellite news, film. Essentially, the one-to-many model of media, a model that perhaps works for propaganda, but not one that fits our needs of radical change, of revolution, of turning over. So if Elon Pape has been suggesting lately that this is the beginning of the end of, Zion, of the Zionist project, then I'd like to suggest that this is also the beginning of the end of media as we have historically known it. Another way to sort of put it is that, you know, if Zionism has partially been a public relations project, right, then the media has also actually partially been an expansive colonizing territorial project. And it's time to obviously move on. And I think the landscape has already shifted. And so let me say why, let me try to explain a little bit why I have this kind of conviction. So starting in the 1960s, throughout the 1970s, and into the present moment, us Palestinians have been obsessed with letting the world know that we exist and what our plight is about. Um, and f we, we first kind of declared our existence spectacularly, by which I literally mean as a spectacle, by hijacking and blowing airplanes, or as in the 1972 Palestinian cinema manifesto of the time would have it, by holding a camera in one hand and a gun in the other. I'm not suggesting that these uh, media st sort of strategies or tactics have necessarily ended, but more that they kind of mark a particular sort of moment that do have continuities into the present. 
So then we can look at the 1980s as another kind of marker in which Palestinians come into the global frame, no longer just as, bless you, as terrorists, as, um, as terrorists, as freedom fighters, or as refugees, but now as occupied peoples, right? So these are the images that we remember of mostly the sort of first intifada. So little kids throwing stones against a tank. The video, one of the first kind of videos to go viral way before, I don't know, Instagram and all of these, was the video of the breaking their bones policy, which was a couple of soldiers sort of literally beating up the, or beating the sort of shoulders and arms of, of a couple of Palestinian cousins. Or the woman in Beit Sahur um, holding these kind of yellow heel, her yellow heels in one hand and throwing a stone with the other. Um, we then meandered throughout the 1990s and 2000s towards kind of ill-fated state building. And as scholars such as Lori Allen and Diana Allen, and I think Dina also just sort of mentioned it, we've sort of been performing ourselves as kind of humanitarian victims. And so I'd like to suggest that now the world already knows uh, Palestine and Palestinians. The world has seen what it is that there is to see. Our predicament is, is identifiable, it is discernible, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's in, endorsed, or uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's endorsed. Not everyone agrees, obviously, but I don't think that anyone can claim ignorance anymore. Um, at this point, those who are wedded to our annihilation and those who are obfuscating reality are doing so on purpose. In the first camp are obviously the Zionist regime, Biden, Christian evangelicals, maybe Sunak, although I don't, I don't really keep up with the UK news so much, but so I don't know. Maybe he's not in that first sort of group, right? Um, he is. Okay, great. So, so you get it. So the, those who are just kind of like, yeah, you know what? We are unabashedly kind of uh, claiming the end of Palestinians. In the second group, this group that's kind of obfuscating the sort of reality of what is actually happening, the sort of reality of what is actually happening, Sorry, we're Hi. sorry. The Canadian government, nations, the John and Lockheed Martin, extractivist corporations like British Petroleum because of the gas fields off of the coast of Gaza, certain liberals, which in the US we call PEPs, right? Progressive except for Palestine, and old media. Collectively, I think all of these obfuscate for a variety of reasons. Pressure from external forces, fear of losing funding or economic assistance, war profiteering, desire for capital accumulation through political normalization with Israel, hatred, a commitment to settler colonialism, or certainly at least a fear for being held accountable as a settler colonial nation, long histories of dehumanizing Arabs, Islamophobia, Holocaust trauma. In a way, the reasons don't matter. I think the structure does. Old media, I think, belongs to the same ecology as settler colonialism, and I think we can add religious colonialism and imperial, imperial colonialism um, building on Khaled. So old media belongs to that same kind of ecology as these different kinds of colonialism and as racial capitalism. They are all part of the same operating system, if I can kind of call it that. Fighting for old media to, to for better representation is a bit like changing the channel, when what we need right now is not to change the channel, but to completely throw the television set out. And when I first, it was really weird to hear Khaled, I'd never been in his class, but when I first thought of this, I was thinking actually of the Titanic, right? I was going to sort of make this metaphor, but it, it didn't work in my head. But it was like, old media is the Titanic. It has sunk. It is sinking. It's time to... I don't know, get on our paddle boards instead, but I just didn't go there. But anyways, um, so um, we need a new operating system. And perhaps I'm going to suggest that we might already have one at our disposal. So allow me to give a quick example. On October 28, 2023, Craig Mukhyber, who was the director of the New York Office of Human Rights for the UN, posted his resignation letter on Twitter, or X. Had he quit 50, 40, 30 years ago, like say during the Rwanda genocide, we would have had to rely on old media to actually tell us the story. We would have had to rely on something like the New York Times, which arguably, had it been about Palestine, the New York Times would have likely not published. 
Okay? But in this contemporary moment and media landscape, he let us hear him, or at least read him, directly. Um, of course, there are filters, but in many ways, this kind of interaction is sort of more direct, but also more mediated than ever. And by direct, I mean that we read exactly what he wrote, and he shares with us exactly what it is that he wants to share with us. And by mediated, it didn't matter where he was, or as my kind of Palestinian grandmother would have probably said at the time, he could have been in Timbuktu, and we would have still kind of read his, his letter. Um, and so the point is that, is that I and you can just click on the letter and read it directly and mediate it. And it is that it is mediated across temporal kind of geographic reaches across different screens that is part of its sort of shared power, okay? So there is a sharedness that speaks to an affective commons information that extends across geographies of our colonial racialized capitalist present. This is precisely why we see a swell of support and solidarity from various corners, from South Africa, from Cuba, from the Global South, from Black Lives Matter, from indigenous movements, from those fighting for LGBTQ plus rights and gender equality, anybody who's sort of been previously subjected to colonizing violence, from the Celtic football team's um, uh, fans, right, to those committed to kinds of positions against oppression and dispossession of all kinds and especially, I think, the majority of Gen Z and below. Um, these are the same groups who, by and large, do not consume old media because they know of the complicity of old media. We live, instead, in an individualized media environment. Each one of us increasingly consumes what we want, often what we already agree with. We generally know the big picture, the general stories, Israel's waging a horrendous war, the US and most previous kind of colonizing entities are in full support, but the interpretation of these stories and the details of what we consume differ. Um, we have individualized media diets. The posts that I like, the memes that you refer to, may not necessarily be the same anymore. Media is no longer a landscape of the same message to everybody, but is really the production and the consumption of difference. And this fragmentation, I think, is paralleled by Palestinian reality, a people who are fragmented from each other and increasingly from their connections to home and the homeland. And so if Gaza teaches us anything, it's that we need to think about that which exceeds representation, which exceeds old media which exceeds the constraints of the old operating system made up as it is of media, of colonialism, and racial capitalism. We need to move beyond enclosure. And so our task as media professionals, as scholars, as diasporic Palestinians, as people in solidarity, is to accept that we are actually fragmented and that we have different individual kind of audiences, if you want to, if you want to sort of speak uh, that language. So rather than seeing the media as something outside of us, we really need to begin to recognize that ourselves as media, we are the mediators. Our first challenge then is to really think of ourselves as building a network. And Gaza is the spark. Our job, those of us on the outside, is to take these kind of incandescent particles and ignite the tinder and spread the fire, especially because our kin are being besotted and bombed into a condition of unlivability. So it becomes our responsibility for those who are outside or beyond Gaza's enclosure to do so. Gazans are asking, in the midst of impossible circumstances, what else could you possibly want to see? Our predicament is known. Our new media landscape and technological tools are at, uh, are at our disposal, and they can be helpful. We have to take the spreadedness, the geographic expanse, and our geographic expanse and our pathological lack. Pathological lack. We should transcribe distance. We can. because of the solidarity. I think we have to kind of speak. Because we're so.
open our own media environments. And so it is our responsibility, I think those of us outside of Gaza and outside of Palestine, to use these tools as the building blocks to network Gaza, if you will, as the site from which solidarity and political struggle can emanate. So to make Gaza the center again, not some distant place beyond enclosure. So we need to change direction. We need to reposition ourselves, those of us outside, as beyond media. So the world knows and the world has known and so to quote Mukhibar's letter again, he pleads at some point that we need to have the courage to abandon the failed paradigm of the past. He's referring to the UN and custodians of human rights and, uh, and standards. But he may as well have been uh, referring to the entire kind of outdated operating system. It is our task then to redefine what our roles are. And I think we might want to begin by putting into the dustbin of history these kind of tropes and inadequacies at this point of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s. It is time to move beyond any kind of fantasies of pan-Arabism. It's time to move beyond Oslo. It's time to move beyond the enclosure of nation states, to move beyond also concerns of representation in old media. To keep focusing on these is really a distraction. What did Khaled call them? I can't remember. That we're kind of drowning in distractions if, if this is what we end up uh, sort of focusing on. And we need to ultimately move beyond this kind of territorial trap. We know that Palestine and Palestinianness is so much more today than the lives between the river and the sea. It is a supranational, uh, geographically spread, and richly diverse entity, a series of individuals, of different media producers and media audiences. It is time for a new Palestine Liberation Network as opposed to Palestine Liberation Organization. So PLN maybe instead of PLO. Um, but one that embraces the fragments, the differences, the distance, and the mediated. Um, as such, it should, again because of what is happening to our brothers and sisters who are made to survive and die in a, in a condition of unlivability, it should come from us. And what I mean by us here is multifold. Palestinian fragments, the 2.1 million in, like inside of Israel, as well as the 3 million in the West Bank and Jerusalem, as well as the millions in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Chile, in Brooklyn, in London, in, I don't know, X, Y, Z, right? But us is also everyone in solidarity, irrespective of creed, of religion, of citizenship, gender, sexuality, and so on. And it is up to all of these us's uh, to transform that spark of Gaza into revolution, into kind of transformation and change. We are the medium, we are, and we are the kind of dialectic knot that can untie these forces of enclosure and that can move us beyond media. I think we have some of these tools already at our disposal, or maybe dispersal is, is, a, is a better word, to build the infrastructure of a Gazan or a Palestinian world making a world making that has already recognized that the horrors committed are not just on Gaza and on Palestine, but on human consciousness and our collective futures. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have um, about uh, 20, 25 minutes for uh, questions and answers, or maybe we can have a discussion amongst us.